Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for making your way to the Barrenbrook tent for this afternoon's talk. We're going to be looking at grass, whether it can be sustainable and make money. Apologies to those of you who might have been expecting David Linton. Uh, my name is Adrian Bell. I'm standing in for David today, uh, and hopefully I'll make as good a job of it as he would have done. Um, but we've got, uh, as you've seen from the program, uh, we've got a panel of three here today to talk about grass. And, and the background to this is that in the UK, we grow around about 9,000 hectares of grass seed at the moment. Now, in the past, that was largely split between two uses, agriculture and amenity. Increasingly, though, we're seeing that agriculture element move away from grass as providing simply a, a, a feedstock, a forage for livestock, and instead to a much wider range of uses on farm, whether that's uh, for enhanced environmental protection, whether that's as a break crop, whether it's for carbon sequestration or improving soil health. There's a lot more uses that we're finding uh, for, for grass on the farm. So what we're trying to do today is to give you some insight into eff effectively making space for grass on your farm, how to do it, the benefits it might bring, uh, and to give you some of the insights uh, from our own team here at Barrenbrook as to how grass seed is produced and the process that, that goes into it to grow grass seed, uh, to clean it, to certify it for use on farm. Barrenbrook itself, of course, Barrenbrook UK, uh, is the, the uh, British arm of an international company founded in the Netherlands, active in 16 countries. And uh, the UK is particularly fortunate in uh, having access to that huge Barrenbrook genetic resource uh, in terms of being able to develop varieties and use uh, genetics which are uh, unique or specially developed for, uh, for use in the UK. Um, Barrenbrook is, is a, a leader in that space and indeed of that 9,000 hectares I mentioned, Barrenbrook grows about a third of that grass seed, so a relatively major player uh, in the market. Um, three speakers today. I'm going to start off with Richard Turner, who is the seed production manager for Barrenbrook UK. Uh, Richard uh, heads up a team of three, uh, responsible for all liaison with Barrenbrook's growers on farms for, for cleaning, for production, for certification. And Richard, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. And uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, this uh, round the table discussion on herbage seed production. So um, as Adrian's just uh, touched on, we're, we're growing around about 9,000 hectares of herbage seed, or herbage seed, grass seed in the UK. And believe it or not, we're still only about 60% self-sufficient in, in that production. So importing grass seed is still quite a, quite a big thing in the UK. Of that 9,000 hectares, um, Barrenbrug are producing around about 3,000 of that. Um, and it's split into two sectors, really. So we've got uh, two sectors to our business. The first one is sports and leisure, and that covers such things as golf. We got, we're quite big into golf in terms of um, greens, fairways, and all the supporting uh, landscaping. Um, turf and sports and leisure, which also covers sports pitches, both winter, summer, Wimbledon, cricket, rugby, football. So, yeah, quite a big market. And we are the UK's largest producer of amenity seed. The other sector of our business is agriculture, um, so that is um, really serving beef, dairy and sheep industry, um, and in the UK we're growing around about 2,000 hectares of seed production in the UK. So in terms of tonnage, we're pushing up for about 3,500 tonnes as a total across both sectors. Our grower network um, consists of around about 55 growers in the UK, our most northerly grower um, if you can call it north, it's not really that far north. It is just outside of Ripon in North Yorkshire. Our most southerly grower is down just outside Southampton. You can see the Isle of Wight from quite a few of his fields. Across into the Suffolk coast, so right on uh, the Suffolk coast, we grow um, quite a bit of amenity grass, and all the way over to um, the Welsh border near Ross and Wye in Herefordshire. Um, so we've got quite a good geographical spread of growers. I, I wouldn't have said that... It, it, matters and where we grow each species of grass. They all grow in most areas of the UK, but traditionally East Anglia is more of our amenity grass seed area. Um, we grow a lot of our fescue. So when I talk about fescue, fescue is something you'll see in a lot of golf greens, 
turf mixtures. It's quite a tough grass. Um, and then um, more agricultural species are grown on the, on the Hereford, uh, Herefordshire sort of bo Welsh border. Grass seed growers, I must say, are um, having a fantastic attention to detail and also very, very passionate about what they do. Um, so that's one thing I will mention about a grass seed grower. What I want to talk about is some of the benefits of growing herbage seed. Herbage seed is a super, super break crop if you compare it against sugar beet or oilseed rape. It ticks quite a few of the regen ag boxes in that you can establish it using minimum tillage. It provides a green cover crop throughout the winter and it also introduces livestock onto, into an arable rotation. First of all, on the herbage seed plot, we can get two bites of the cherry in that we get two harvest years off one establishment. So crop that we're going to be establishing this autumn in 2022 will give us a harvest for 23 and 2024. We can also go to 2025 if we deem the crop to be clean enough after the, the second year, um, but there is a slight yield penalty to that. Um, grass, as we all know, there's no point in me coming up here and, and really um, banging on about how good grass is as a, as a, as a cover crop and a break crop. Um, it's a fantastic uh, crop at producing root structure um, and busting pans and building organic matter. A grower, often a well-known grower who we use, often says to me, you know, Richard, when I grow grass in my second year after grass, my wheat regularly does 10, 11 tonnes to the hectare. And that is due to the fact that grass will put in 100 tonnes per hectare of organic matter. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. Compare that against a winter wheat crop of about 10. 10 tonnes a hectare is put in for a winter wheat crop. Um, establishment, we can establish grass in two methods, really. First thing I want to say about establishment is that you can use your existing kit. So there's no need to go and splash out on a fancy drill. You know, a standard sort of drill can be used. It can be established either in the spring or in the autumn. Ideal autumn drilling date is around about the 15th of September. In the spring, I always say, if you can get on the ground early in sort of end of February, beginning of March, get it in. The beauty of a spring crop, we can also um, use it as a, uh, alongside a companion crop, usually uh, spring barley. So the best way to establish it is, use, is, is block off some of the coulters on a, on a drill. So we have a, a 30 centimetre colt width on the barley. That allows plenty of light to get in because um, obviously barley is quite competitive and will start to creep at a, an early stage. The grass can either be just simply broadcast on top or it can be physically drilled in between the rows of the barley. Seed rates are very, very low. Um, so we're on average for a perennial rye grass, hybrid Italian type of grass, we're sowing at about 10 kilos a hectare. Some of you think, crikey, that is very, very low. It is, because at the end of the day, we're trying to harvest seed, not lots of green forage leaves. So each plant um, needs a level of light uh, and resource, such as water, nutrition, to produce plenty of tillers. At the end of the day, we want the crop to tiller. Tiller, tiller, tiller. Tillers mean seed head. Seed head means seed. Seed equals profit. So... That's why we're using quite such a, a, a low seed rate. The other plus of growing herbage seed is um, on some species, mainly on hybrid species and some Italians, you also have the opportunity to get a silage cut before the seed harvest. Now, this usually takes place around about the end of April, beginning of May, and it allows um, the, the grower to use that as a potential feedstock, whether it be put into a clamp to feed cattle or it can be used to go into an AD plant. We've got quite a few growers down in Kent who use the hybrid to, to fuel the AD plant. The byproduct after the seed harvest is hay. It's quite stalky, but it, is quite pal it can be quite palatable and can be used to feed livestock or, again, be used to you know, bed down cattle or as a, as a biofuel for straw-fired power stations. Um, all, one other thing I would like to say about the benefit of growing herbage seed, all of the seed that we grow in the UK has been sold in the UK, so we are serving our home market. Okay, so that's quite a, a strong point. Um, practicalities of, of growing herbage seed. 
as I said before, it's a sinless establishment to growing cereals. Um, herbicide um, applications are mainly only in the first year of, of, of um, production, so the succeeding autumn, autumn from drilling is when we put the uh, first herbicides on. It's mainly effumacate-based herbicides, so usually two, one or two applications of effumacate in the, in the frosty cold conditions usually sees us through. Nitrogen, um, usually in two splits, uh, totaling around about 160 to 180 kilos a hectare put on in each year. Second year will probably be the higher rate, so first year around about 160 kilos of N. That can be put on either through digestate, we've had some really good results using liquid digestate, chicken manure or um, bagged artificial M. Second year crops would need a slightly higher rate of about 180 kilos, um, again ap applied either by organic or inorganic. Fungicides, it's quite light on fungicides. Uh, we put two fungicides on. First one usually about the beginning of May, middle of May, which is usually a Silter X-Pro type product. And then we follow that. That usually gives us about four weeks cover. And then we follow up with a, a tebiconazole product, which would last us up to harvest. Growth regulator grass is quite heavy on growth regulator. We need to hit it hard to enable it to put more energy into growing the, the actual seed crop. Um, so we're using... Um, Medex Max, which is quite new to the market, it's quite gentle. Um, we've also used Modus and Optimus. Harvesting uh, takes place in June or July, depending on the species. So a fescue um, would be harvested around about the first week in July, so it's a couple of weeks away. And then a late diploid or tetraploid. So when I talk about diploid and tetraploid, obviously that's the plodity of the glass, and the lateness is the heading date. So most late varieties head last week of May, beginning of June. Um, obviously, harvest roughly is about nine weeks after that heading date. So we can be harvesting grass, hopefully, uh, by the end of August. But if we're harvesting in September, then we've had a bit of a, a disaster. Traditionally, there's two or three ways you can combine the crop. Combining the crop can be challenging if you haven't got the right kit or the right conditions. Fescues are mainly cut direct using a traditional header. Um, but more, more traditionally, perennial ryegrass, especially agricultural species, are mown. So traditional disc mower, no conditioner. Obviously, we don't want to knock the seed out of the crop. Lay the crop down for about three or four dry days. And then you can usually go along with a pickup header on the front of a traditional straw, wake, straw walker combine, if possible. And then just honk, honk straight into the combine. Or we can use a, a Shelbourne Reynolds stripper header which is the more preferred option, which is a lot more flexible. So if we are experiencing catchy weather, you can go in with a stripper, harvest it at probably around about 35% moisture, and you're also taking a lot, lot less material into your combine, so it's more efficient. When we harvest a grass seed, it's very wet. Um, it's anywhere between uh, 25 and 35% moisture. So the first thing it wants to do is compost which is obviously a challenge. So drying or conditioning the seed is very, very important. So we need to have access to a drying floor. Trying to think about putting grass seed through a continuous flow dryer is not an option. It will block up. And also with a continuous flow dryer, you'll, you'll potentially cook the germination by over, over drying it. So drying floor, seed is um, as soon as you've got a tank load um, off the combine, onto the trailer, get it tipped onto the drying floor, about a metre deep um, uh, height, so don't go and pile it up to three or four metres deep, and get the air blowing through it. It will want to try and compost, and the key is to get the temperature out of it as quickly as possible, because as soon as the temperature goes sort of pushing above 40 degrees, we end up with some very, very expensive silage. Um, we aim to get the moisture below 14%, and at that stage it's quite safe and stable to store. And uh, then we start the cleaning process. So at Barrenbrook, we have access to nine cleaning plants throughout the UK. Um, a lot of them are uh, grower-owned. So we have great flexibility in being able to serve our customer base with varieties as and when they come off um, tap. So drying, clean, cleaning the seed is fairly straightforward. I'm sure you've seen the seed cleaners. They go through a series of sieves to remove a lot of the inert matter, stick, stalk, soil, insect remains and then some cylinders with different size indents which can then remove the weed seed. The seed is then packaged, um, samples are taken and certified through um, the, the certification process 
We all aim to grow um, higher voluntary standard seed, all certified to HVS, so the highest seeds in the highest um, standard in the land. And then we are able to go and market the seed. Hopefully that's given you a, a, a brief overview over what we do, or what, I, what my department does within Barenbrook. Thanks for that brilliant introduction, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure now to ask David Barker uh, to come up and uh, take the microphone. Uh, Richard mentioned during his speech uh, about the um, sheer attention to detail and indeed the passion uh, that a lot of seed growers have in producing their crops. And I think David is a prime example of that. He's uh, a third generation seed grower, farms outside Stowe Market in Suffolk. Um, and you've been farming, I think, for, for 57 years. Isn't yeah, that right, David? <laughs> David, over right. to you. Thank you. Whoops. Thank you very much. I better stand on this thing here. There, so there we all are on the screen. My, I'm left. Next to me is my son, Patrick. Brian, my nephew, and my brother. Um, you probably heard of the, the boys more maybe than me because we've got a str an AHD strategic farm, uh, a leaf demonstration farm, and... Patrick's on the Nature Friendly Farming Network Council. And, and actually, interestingly, we've got apparently a film crew coming in the next two weeks to film for a, a major BBC series, which David Attenborough will be overseeing. And we're looking at the really the environmental stewardship of the farm. And, I mean, looking back at the farm, it's interesting in an event like this because, you know, I go back as a little boy in the 1950s, and at that time... The average farm in Suffolk was 95 acres, and every farm would have been a wildlife oasis because they were little farms. Everyone would have had livestock. We had six dairy herds in our own parish, and there were beef. And, and actually, the, the livestock, along with those small farms, the, the bird population of sparrows, starlings, was just phenomenal. And, it, you know, it really was a time... And we, we harp back a bit, don't we, to the 1950s. And there were fantastic quantities. And the insects, which associated with livestock, were part of the, the whole ecosystem. And it, we can't ever go back to that. But what we can do, under things like stewardship, which we're involved in, and Ian knows quite a lot about because you've been giving us advice, advice on soils, that you can actually, in a modern system, have a farm which can be really wildlife-friendly. You can have a large quantities of birds insects we haven't actually used any insecticides on our farm for until once this recently because of black bean aphid we haven't used insecticides for four years and it is possible if you can get the beneficial insects and all the right ecosystems operating on the farm and it's not actually not rocket science it's um farming really well producing abundance of food but also producing an abundance of wildlife and it's not rocket science and you can do it so I'll get off my high horse and start again. <laughs> um, we started grass seed growing way back. My great uncle once told me he bought a farm from the proceeds of a crop of wild white clover. I don't know whether we'd ever do that today at £10,000 an acre, but that's a fact. Um, and my father, when we purchased the farm we live in now, he purchased it in 1957 and he paid £47, 10 shillings an acre which is a, a different world, and then he bought a bit more land at 68, and we bought more land since, so we've now got about 1,350 acres, um, which part of it was my grandfather's farm. And in those first year he bought the farm, it had a 80 acres of sugar beet, and he, he turned up in the middle of October, and every bit of it was in the ground, and he had a real struggle getting it out, and for two years he grew sugar beet, and that was it, the destruction to the soil was just unbelievable, particularly this heavy, bold, heavy boulder clay. And so grass seeds have become uh, an essential, really an integral part of our farming system ever since. Um, we grew red clover, I can remember. We've tried Coxford. We've grown Timothy in wide rows. I even had a crop of red fescue, which is an interesting story goes with that. The old boy who used to buy all our hay... He came to me and he said, cool, that red fescue hay looks fantastic. And I said, well, they tell me cattle won't eat it. Oh, no, he said, that, that's lovely stuff. They'll love that. So he loaded his lorry up with all these bales, about four, three or 400 bales on his lorry, took it off down to a farm in Cambridgeshire. They duly put all the hay into the mangers 
and the cattle all stood there and looked at it. <laughs> and I said, oh, blimey, I wish you'd listened to what I'd said in the first place, but never mind. So we, we move on. Um, there we go, the next slide. That's my dad, I'm pleased to say. In those early days, we grew S varieties, where S varieties came out of Aberystwyth. S215 Medifescue, S23 Ryegrass. And we, for a couple of years, we had a continuous flow dryer, which wasn't ideal. And then they invented a system whereby you could have a central tunnel and ducts coming off it, and your grass seed piled up uh, with hessian over the ducts, and that was the ideal way in those early days to actually harvest and dry, above all, grass seed. In the 19, early 1960s, well, mid 1960s, there was a seed company called Harold Sad in Ipswich who went bust, and my father went down there and said, I've got to invest in seed cleaning plant on the farm. And um, I can recognize you. <laughs> and um, so he went off down to Ipswich and he bought Harold Sad seed cleaning. And the idea was that he had to actually clear the whole lot. And so what they did, they, they obviously took a gang of guys and we'd have about six or eight men on the farm at that time. And they dismantled it all um, and then he paid a hundred pounds for it. And an interesting story because in the 1960s, so they set off half past seven in the morning with a Ford 65 and a couple of trailers and they, and you wouldn't have an A14 in those days. You drove through the middle of Stowe Market, through the middle of Needham Market, and in Ipswich, practically everybody was on a bicycle. And of course, they loaded these trailers up with all this seed cleaning plant and, and brought it home. Unfortunately, when they were <laughs> driving out of Ipswich, a huge wind got up and there was so much dust and they covered all the cyclists in dust which had come out of the seed cleaning plant as they traveled back, but never mind. So we moved on to the 1970s having put this seed cleaning plant together. And the next slide actually is my granddad. So my granddad's on a senator combine in the 1970s. And those days, that particular field is a big field, 90 acres. It took three men three days with a finger mower to mow it. And then it would take another, you'd have to leave it for about uh, five days or so just to dry. And then we had three senator combines for three days harvesting it. It was a, a major operation because, you know, at that time in the 70s, the, 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 the me mechanics of the job were really quite, you know, quite intense and quite time consuming. And while they were mowing it with the three mowers, there was a fourth person on the edge of the field constantly sharpening knives and replacing the, the bits which had fallen off because, you know, and we don't realize just how a labor intensive farming was in the 1970s. Um, but we did put our cleaning plant together and we've got a, a turner, no relation dresser, a Boswell, which is also a cleaner, and two sets of indented cylinders, which are probably unique in terms of cleaning grass seed, but they are there, they're historic, and they still work, which is great. So we, we grew for goldsmiths, and that's, a, uh, that's just showing you how the grass seed would look in the spring. Goldsmiths of Berris and Edmonds, until they were purchased out by Barenberg in around 1979. The first variety, they all begin with B-A-R, so I'm wondering whether we're going to have a bar barker, but we might do one day. But anyway, Barry was the first variety which we grew, followed by Bar Barlano, Bardessa, Bahrain, Bar Lady, which actually was a really good variety, and so was Bar Gold, which again was another really good amenity ryegrass. And we've more recently had Bar Olympic, Bar Mario, Bar Donna, and we've now got Bar Bastion. So the problem is they do tend to change a bit more quickly these days <laughs> because of new varieties coming along. The key to growing grass seed has been a thumosate. It started off as Nortron, as a really good chemical for controlling grass weeds in grass seed. It'll take annual meadowgrass, rough stalks, meadowgrass, wild oats, and leave ryegrass behind, and it's invaluable. We, we partly nearly lost it because it was one of those chemicals that, in their wisdom, certain people decided they, they really wasn't worth maintaining. And um, fortunately, we were able to lobby quite hard. My MP is now a DEFRA minister, which helped. And Victoria Prentice did actually make the decision that she felt that it was actually right for us to keep that product. And it was a political decision more than anything because they're under so much pressure from various green groups to ban every chemical there is. But the thumosate is absolutely vital for us. And um, as we moved on, they've got the stripper header, which has just been mentioned, absolutely transformed our grass seed production because no longer did we have to mow for three days a field with three mowers. You can go straight in and strip the grass seed off the stalk. 
which means you haven't got this vast quantity of forage going through the combine. And the number of times we've ended up in a field unblocking a drum on a combine is unbelievable. And But with the stripper header, so little of the hay actually goes through the combine and it strips the seed off and it's, it's really transformed the job and it's made such a, a big difference. We also have, and the next slide will show you a drying floor, which with 1978 was state of the art and it actually still is fantastic because the grass seed comes in off the combine and is piled up and is we can put a big quantity on that floor um, and you have to get air through it very quickly because without that it heats up and germination's lost and as Richard said you've got something of very low value. The, the grass seed floor has 50% of it is air and we have now got a gas burner to heat it up if we need to. We cringe at the cost of heat, heating it and paying for a gas burner this year but we do face challenges, you know, and, and, and we have to be realistic. You know, there are people out there who want to ban, for example, glyphosate. And glyphosate is on a regenerative farming system. And we, we, we wouldn't say we're regenerative. We do a lot, great deal of direct drilling. And glyphosate is absolutely vital. And without it, a lot of farming systems and the sort of farming systems advocated today would really struggle. And we must keep glyphosate. And I consider it to be about as safe a product as anyone could have. We've had a, a, a particular difficulty because they banned dual-purpose seed dressings. And after grass seed, we would always put winter wheat in. But with, that, with the loss of dual-purpose seed dressings, we're now getting much more of a problem from wireworm, leather jackets, um, slugs we always did have a problem with. And now we've actually gone to putting beans in after grass seed because of the, the pressure put on us by losing dual-purpose seed dressings. But um, hopefully, two crops of grass and a field of beans, we might be able to get something like three really good crops of wheat afterwards. And on our Beckles series clay, wheat is, is, is really the, the, the best crop we can grow. So grass seed in, in really just looking back, um, the last slide probably goes back to showing the four of us, but the grass seed is actually, as has been said, a superb crop for soil in terms of building organic matter, improves texture, improves structure, and, you know, as long as you're sensible the way you farm and you don't go crashing around with a great big heavy machines, which if you can actually float over the soil with the grass and direct drill, you've got, you know, very little impact on the soil and you can, you can have a really good establishment. Um, we, we often have sheep. People call them the golden hoof. And they're fantastic from the point of view of that grass crop. They're not so great on amenities because they don't produce the forage, but the agricultural varieties. But I've grown grass seed for something like 57 years, as was said. And obviously I have a passion for farming and production. Can I just finish? <laughs> I'll finish with a story about Bar Percy. Anybody's heard of Robin Van per Percy? I'm sure that they named this Bar Percy after him. And this chap on my left rings me up a few months ago and says, would you clean some Bar Percy for me? And I said, OK. He said, there's 10 and a half tonnes. I said, well, that's not that much, actually. We, we produce about 75 tonnes a year. So we, 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 we got the bar percy on the farm, and I put the first batch through, and I thought there's a bit of annual metagrass in this. So when we were, did the first test at the local seed lab, not only did we test what we cleaned, I tested what came in the first place. And how it ever got certified, Richard, I don't know. I'm not meant to say this, am I? But I'm going off piece now. But... The Bar Percy, which was certified in Holland, had 350 annual metagrasses per 60 grams. And I thought, oh, my word. Anyway, we put it through the first time, through this lovely old seed clean, cleaning plant. And we got it down to 40, and I thought, that's a pretty good job. Richard comes back to me and said, oh, no, no, I've got to have it cleaner than that. So I thought, oh, flipping heck. Okay, so we'll do it one more time. So uh, we put it through, and we the 10.5 tonnes by now was 8.5 tonnes. And we got it down to nine annual metagrass. And I thought, haven't we done well? And he rings up Richard and he said, no, no, I've got to have it cleaner. And I said, what on earth are you doing with this grass seed to get it so clean? And he said, it's going on premiership football pitches. To which I said, John will go spare. But if we can have two tickets or at least maybe four to the new Tottenham Stadium, I think I might persuade him to put it through. <laughs> and so... I had to say to John, do you want the good news or the bad news? The bad news is you've got to put it through again. The, the good news, we're off to Tottenham, aren't we? You, you, you can keep you to that. So there you go. He's admitted in front of 80 people that we're off to the Tottenham Stadium. So anyway, that's an interesting story. But I can tell you, 
I'm not, when I clean this grass seed, we're, we dispose of the, the screenings, but I have to be honest, I've kept a bit of bar Percy and I put my lawn down to it, and it is the most fantastic piece of grass I've ever had. So I think bar Percy, remember that, easy to remember because of Robin Van Percy and Man U and Arsenal and all that. So thank you very much and thank you for listening, and I'll hand over to the agronomist. David, thank you very much. Uh, a, a wonderful whirlwind tour through, I think, uh, seven or eight decades of grass seed growing on your farm. So uh, thank you for that insight. You mentioned in particular that uh, you remember those scenes from the 50s and that kind of bucolic uh, farming environment, uh, which is something which we, we can't quite go back to. But we can get back to something approaching it, I think, is what you intimated that. And um, here to share some of that vision of, of what we can get back to um, is our agronomist, Ed Barker. Uh, Ed is head of uh, agroecology. <laughs> Sorry, Barker, Brown. We're not, we're not related, <laughs> are we, David? Uh, Ed Brown. That's your that. son. Uh, Ed is head of agroecology at, uh, at Hutchinson's, uh, based in Shropshire, uh, oversees a, a portfolio of quite mixed farms, bearing in mind that part of the country, uh, and works very closely with uh, farmers on issues such as uh, soil health and how to bring grass into your standard arable rotation. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, I'm going to stay seated because it's hot and there's no need for unnecessary movement, I don't think. Um, I'm going to talk more about grass in general uh, rather than specifically grass seed production um, and how that fits in. It's actually quite ironic that Harry, who's a client of mine, has just turned up because this is the first time ever he's going to hear me talk about grass in a positive way because <laughs> um, we, have, we have our own unique challenges over in Shropshire with, with ryegrass. But, um, so as, as people are sort of... So my job predominantly is helping people shift towards regenerative systems and inevitably, that quite often means bringing back in livestock, but also, you know, even when there isn't livestock, there's always a drive for improving soil health. So grass, um, in a number of ways, whether it be, you know, to feed livestock or to produce seed or even under stewardship schemes, can actually be a really good way of, of helping us get to where we need to get to. So... Um, it's already been mentioned that grass is quite a good break. So in an arable rotation, we're always looking for, for breaks. So breaking that pest and disease cycle, whichever crop that may apply to. And obviously, grass is a really good way of doing that. Um, it's also a good way of building fertility in the rotation. So as we look to reduce inputs, particularly nitrogen, uh, having, a, having a, an opportunity in the rotation to build fertility, and I'm talking specifically more here about diverse lays that include clovers as well, it's a really great way of doing so. Improving soil structure. So we're looking at, uh, we're looking at a perennial crop. So what we're trying to achieve all the time, and as you, those of you who have studied Regen Ag for a long time will know one of the key principles is keeping roots in the ground all the time. So with a perennial crop, that's obviously a lot easier to do. Um, and all the time that roots are in the ground, they're producing carbon root exudates, which are pumping down into the soil, feeding biology, and in return, they're giving nutrients back to the crop. So having uh, a mixed sward, but particularly grass, is a really good way of keeping that carbon cycle going and that exchange between, between the crop and biology. Um, it's also quite, you know, if you, it's, an, it's, a, it's a way of spreading risk. So rather than being wholeheartedly into uh, arable, combinable crops, it's an alternative in the rotation which you might be able to capitalise on to spread your business risk. Uh, obviously, if you're bringing livestock into the enterprise, you're going to need forage. Um, and grass-based forage is obviously an excellent way to do that and make good use of the land. Um, it's also a good way of improving habitat. So, you know, uh, most farms are a sort of mixed habitat. You've got water, you've got trees, you've got arable crops, you've got hedges. But bringing grass into the rotation is, is yet another another habitat, especially those sorts of lays where you can, where through management you can let some of the species within them flower, you're bringing in extra bird life, uh, insect life, um, pollinators, so it's a really good way of boosting biodiversity on farm, which obviously David knows, knows all about. So those for me are sort of some of the, the key benefits of, of having grass in the rotation. Um, some key considerations really and, and, and things that just need 
considering before you before you dive in. Um, grass can be a, a real benefit, entirely dependent on how you manage it. So you can you can come out of a grass lay with worse soil structure, worse fertility, dependent on how you manage it. So making sure that you've got soil structure sorted in the first place, you've got nutri nutrition sorted in the first place, and how you manage that crop during its its cycle, however long it's in the in the in the ground, whether it be a year, three years, five years, what you do to it in that time will will depend on whether it's a benefit or whether it's negative. And I've seen just as many fields come out of a grass lay in poorer condition than they went in as I have those coming out in in a better nick. So it's really important to pay attention to detail. And on that point, treat treat grass like any other crop. You know, if we if we went out and bought wheat seed, put it in the drill, planted it, we'd give a huge amount of attention to detail to every aspect of producing that wheat crop and grass should be no different so think about soil structure think about establishment you know we're we're all here hopefully you're trying to move towards less tillage but if a little bit of tillage means that that grass crop gets away and succeeds your your soil health will be all the better for it so don't be afraid to move a bit of soil if you need to um so yeah soil management nutrition and then just if it's if it's grass for grazing you know, try and move away from set stocked, heavy stocking at the wrong times of the year because that's going to put you in that position of coming out worse the other end. Um, if you're cutting it, you know, are we looking at high end, straight rye grass, four cuts a year, or actually can we come back a bit from that and go, well, let's bring a bit of diversity in it, let's bring a legume in with it, reduce our nitrogen inputs, reduce the amount of traffic on that field, which is a real key thing. Um, Weed control as well, so managing that grass beyond it being a grass crop in the rotation, just think about how that's going to play out in the following crop. Um, and also weed control within that grass lay, so it's, it's, you can get very unstuck very quickly going out and s spending money on a really expensive all singing, all dancing herbal lay to put it in and six months later it's full of docks and thistles and you've got no options for controlling them. So quite often a good way if you're going into grass is, is actually drill the grass, let it come, let the weeds come, sort the weeds out, and then bring in your other species after that. So that just, just consider how you're going to do those things. And that comes down to individual field history and, and knowing what your weed burden is. Pests is another thing. So if, if grass is in the ground for any length of time, there's a potential there for, for soil pests to build up and that needs to be considered for the following crop. As David alluded to, we haven't got all of the seed treatments we used to have. Maybe we actually didn't want them. So, it, you know, it's not always a, a bad thing that these things have gone, but you need to consider it. So uh, the suggestion of, of a pulse crop after wheat is actually really good because whilst uh, a grass crop will soak up a lot of nitrogen, it does take time for it to release it to the following crop. So if you we quite often used to see if you put two wheats in after a grass, it's the second one that sees the most benefit from nitrogen. So actually by putting a pulse after a grass crop, that pulse is sorting itself out for nitrogen. Your grass is beginning to break down within the soil, your biology gets to work on it, and then the wheat crop after that is an absolute stonker. So you know it's quite, quite a good way of coming out of, of, of grass. So I think that's it for me in terms of benefits and considerations. Um, yeah, we'll take any questions, I think. Well, Ed Brown, thank you very much for, for that. Um, if you do have any questions or queries for any member of the panel, uh, now's your chance. We've got a few minutes left before the end of the session. Uh, so there is a roving mic, I think, if anyone has any questions. Um, something I'm, I'm keen to know in the meantime, David and uh, Richard, you both mentioned the importance of uh, FF fumosate uh, for grass seed production. Uh, and while it's got a... a stay of execution at the moment. We don't know how long that might be. Um, also, there, there's still a question mark uh, some years down the line, possibly hanging over glyphosate. So, um, you know, what is the future of seed production without one or both of those chemicals? Yeah, I'll go first on that one. So, obviously, um, farming out of a can is, is, is basically going to be written into the history books probably in, in my lifetime, if not my daughter's lifetime. So um, we're looking at it from a double-pronged approach. Yes, um, we need to be looking at technology, whether that be selector, uh, selection of weed species in a field and some form of termination, whether that be... Sorry, spying on my glasses. Uh, 
uh, whether that be through electrocution, laser, flamethrower, who knows what it's going to be. But yeah, we need to start to enhance camera technology especially. For me, camera technology is, is absolutely key to it. And then the other end of the production is the sea cleaning. You know, David, you'll probably agree with me, the sea cleaning plant technology hasn't really moved on since, what, the 1950s or 60s. You know, it's just got bigger and bigger. Um, so for me, it's really about, you know, 3D imagery of seed and, and being able to remove those seeds efficiently without losing too many um, of the ryegrass seeds. So if I look at black grass, for example, black grass is, is one of the most difficult seeds you could ask to clean out of a, uh, out of a, a herbage seed crop. You know, if anybody comes to me and, you know, the first question I ask is, have you got uh, any black glass population in any of your fields? Because if you have, um, we should end the conversation now about growing herbage seed because it is nearly impossible to clean out. If we can either remove that through camera technology or, or compressed air or vacuum, I, I don't know, come up with solutions, but they're the kind of things that we need to be looking at because, yeah, we have got a stay of execution on ethopunicate. I think the label is until 2033, but we all know that the uh, labels don't always mean an awful lot. But, you know, we do need to look towards other alternatives than farming out of a can, and, um, yeah, we'll, it will happen. That's my personal opinion. I mean, if I follow up, I, I cannot see us at this moment growing grass seed without a thumosate. It is just such a really good product of taking most of the weeds out. We farm successfully with it. I don't think they've ever recorded any high levels in water courses. And sometimes when you start talking about flame and whatever else, the actual alternatives might be environmentally far more damaging because I think it's as about as safe a product as you can have. I know we've got systems now where people are growing grass in quite wide rows. We grew Timothy all those years ago in wide rows. But then if you're into row cultivating or hoeing, you're actually losing moisture, which you don't want to do because in our dry springs now, Preservation of moisture is absolutely vital. Um, we've got to stay of execution to 2033, so it'll probably see me out, so I haven't got to worry about it. <laughs> but, um, but it, I mean, it is, you know, going back onto glyphosate, um, the, the systems which we now have, we, we plough about 10% of the farm per year. My, my nephew said, what was the point of churning over th millions of tonnes of soil just to make a seedbed? You don't need to, and with these, some of these drills you'll see out here, we've got a horse, which is one of those out there, and it's a fantastic bit of equipment, and our diesel, which we now use per acre, has gone down from about 80 pounds an acre down to 45, and that's mainly because we're not churning the engines, ploughing, doing all these cultivations, power harrowing, and that's a far more sustainable system if you can reduce your the amount of diesel you're using and I'm very much you know this is the future looking out over there and and grass seeds part of that but so um, I think you can you can direct we direct drill our grass seed now um, if we're under sowing we can do the barley and the grass seed at the same time with the horse or whatever similar equivalent so you know there is great progress I, I just don't see progress in the forms of you 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 guys tell me you want pure rye grass like bar percy 100% and that's going to be incredibly difficult to produce in the field. Ian might come in here because he's a soil scientist. But, um, but you know, let, let Ed say it and say it. OK, well, I'll pass over. Yeah, it's, um, I'd echo those thoughts. We do, we do need to, to stop farming out of a can. And, and largely, we're able to do that by employing all the different techniques that you'll all be familiar with. We can generally get to a point where we're, we're an awful lot less reliant on... on various inputs be it fertilizer or pesticides but just occasionally you find this this niche where there's a crop or a situation where we really don't have many options in fact we've got one which you've just mentioned um and obviously ether fumizate in grass grass um, grass seed production and glyphosate are two of those those situations where we just really struggle to get to get beyond that that out of a can approach um but from all the things that we see here at the moment and things that are happening on farm, much like David, I have faith that we'll, we'll find ways of doing it. Um, I work with, an, with a couple of other crops whereby weed control is incredibly difficult and the, the, the options are limited, if not non-existent. Um, and we're beginning to look at row spacings, inter-row control, be that mowing, spraying, weeding. Um, robotics is coming down the line. So I think 
these difficult situations we find ourselves in will be overcome. You know, agriculture over the years has been an incredibly ingenious industry and it's found solutions to problems before and I think it will again. Well, thank you to our panellists for, for providing those answers. Uh, any, any other questions before we close the session today? Um, one, one further thing before uh, we go, there is, just behind you is the Baron Brood stand. Um, at three o'clock there will be a tour of uh, the various grass and herbage plots there if, if anyone is interested in uh, either hearing more about those or indeed picking up with Richard on any of the points uh, that we've, we've talked about today. Um, otherwise, uh, I want to ask you just to thank our panel, uh, Richard Turner, David Barker and Ed Brown for sharing their thoughts with us today.